Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you ready for the Word of God this morning? Yes. All right. Well, turn with me again to Proverbs. Proverbs. And uh, again, I'll read to you just that passage which we've been studying or we've been taking our lead from. Proverbs chapter 4. Say, I'm ready for the Word of God to minister to me. All right, good. Proverbs 4.20, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Where, where do you keep them? Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it, out of what? springs the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Now we've been, we've been studying in this and I won't go into the time. If you haven't been with us uh, recently, then, then go online and download the last number of lessons lessons of, of, of sermons, and, and you will catch right up with us. But real briefly, we've, we've been talking about the fact that spiritual things are from the inside out. Natural things are from the outside in. And, and so God is saying here that there is a place on the inside of you where He dwells, which is where we're supposed to live out of. We don't make our decisions based on the external, on the outward, on what we can see, on what we can hear, on what we can taste, on what we can touch and what we can smell. All of the five senses are not what determines how we live. Jesus brought heaven to earth in the way he lived. He brought a manifestation of God through him. He lived with the eternity that was in his heart and he allowed it to flow out of his life. He allowed it to flow out of his mouth. In fact, that sometimes he allowed it to flow out of his eyes. I think all of the time, I think the scriptures make reference to it a few times. He, he says, looking at him, he loved him. Can you, can you imagine what that, that look would have been like? It's like... <laughs> I, I can't, I'm just trying to, you know, I put it into these, um, these sort of, I have these funny little things I try and think of, how, how that would have looked. And, how, how does that, looking at him, he loved him. It was some kind of, some kind of eye radiation. It was like, you know, in, in a good way, in a good way. Just, just beaming on the, in, into you. Oh, I think that's wonderful. Jesus, Jesus let, let the goodness of God come from the inside out. And it affected people. It, it affected people. That, that holiness, that righteousness, that goodness, that love that everything about him that just came out of him, you know, it affected people. Broken people, broken people felt made whole by it. You know, people who were locked up and, and, and bound to sin, when they came in contact with this, they repented. They, they got set free and turned away from that sin and went and, sin, and sinned no more. You know, it, it happened because Jesus came but he didn't just walk around in his own glory. Do, do you know what I mean? Jesus didn't walk around in this glory bubble and it never went further than him. He came, he walked around, so out of him would flow this goodness, these rivers of life. And when he went, while he walked on the earth, he said something so significant. And we've talked about this before, I'll just make reference to it again. Many of us at some time, I'm sure, have thought to ourselves, oh man, wouldn't it have been amazing to have walked the shores of Galilee, walked around Jerusalem with Jesus in the, in the flesh. I mean, that would be an amazing thought to do that. Amazing thing. Yeshua. Hamashiach. The Savior who was anointed. And yet Jesus makes this statement. It is better for you if I go. It is better for you if I go. I'm sure the disciples struggled with that statement. I mean, they, they've, they've not known 
how it was. They didn't know at that point how it was going to be, what life was going to be life, like filled with him, filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Anointed One and His Anointing. The Ruach HaKodesh. The Holy Spirit. They didn't know. So he says, hey, I'm going to go. And, 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 and you can just imagine, I think you and I would have had the same reaction. No, don't, don't go anywhere. We like having you here. This is great. And yet he says, no, 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 no you don't understand. It's better for you if I do go. Because if I don't go, the Father can't send the Holy Spirit. If I go, the Holy Spirit will come to you. Now that's an amazing statement. Because for you and I that means that even though we've lived, we are on the earth now, 2,000 years after Jesus was here, after his footprints you know, were marked in dust and sand, 2,000 years after he walked around on the planet, it is now better for us. We can know him more intimately because of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. That's an amazing statement. He, he, made, some, he made a similar uh, inference when he talked about John the Baptist. He said, of all the prophets of the Old Testament, there was none greater than John. That's a big statement. I mean, if you, <laughs> I mean uh, and, and rightly so, John was the one chosen to come in the spirit of Elijah and announce the Messiah. That, that's, that's pretty great. It doesn't get much greater than that. But can you imagine? I mean, you think about all the prophets. I mean, there was some pretty awesome stuff that happened. What are some of, some of the things that happened through prophets? Think about it. Come on, tell me some stuff. Dead were raised. Yep. 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 I mean, Fire from heaven. There was some, I mean, that, some amazing stuff went on, right? Some amazing stuff went on from some of these prophets. I mean, powerful things that happened through these. I mean, even when they were dead. <laughs> I mean, one of them's bones still carried so much power in them that a dead body that went down uh, into the grave hit those bones and bang, he's alive again. I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about some, there was some serious anointing and some serious power going on. And yet, and, and Jesus says, in all the Old Testament, there's none greater than John. And then he says this, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's not putting different people in. He's basically, you know, the person that was born again two seconds ago hasn't learned anything yet, hasn't done anything yet, is greater than him. Wow. That's amazing. Why? Because we have an intimacy. With him now, we have a flow. We have, we have the ability uh, for him to flow through us and minister to us and through us on a, in a capacity that none of the Old Testament prophets had and none of the apostles had before Jesus was resurrected, put his blood on the mercy seat, and then sent the Holy Spirit to fill the church. Wow. So, so now, we don't live just on external. And we certainly don't run our lives based on the external. Now out of our bellies should flow rivers of living water. There, there is an anointing, a way to live that comes from the inside out. And here it says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. There is a grace of God, a supply of a sufficiency that enables you to live in a way that it is impossible for you to live any other way. It is God living His life through you. Praise God. Grace of God. And then He says at the same time, in the same breath, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. So there is something about the way we then speak there's something about what comes out of our heart and, and also mustn't be cut off by our mouths, and we call that faith. What comes out of our mouth, out of the abundance of our heart, and the substance of that, we call that faith. Uh, the message I'm preaching today I want to talk to you about is the place of grace. The place of grace. And I want you to understand this, and I want you to understand 
today, and I believe the Lord wants us to understand today, the, the beautiful, powerful, and dynamic relationship between faith and grace. The Bible says it talks about this grace in which we stand. Well, if I'm standing in, 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 a, in something, I'm in a place. This grace in which we stand. The Bible also says in the book of Hebrews that we come boldly to the throne of grace. This is a place in which we can stand. But there's, there's nothing about grace that happens outside of faith. And so we need to understand this beautiful relationship. And right here in Proverbs, we see it. We see that there's this place of the heart, and out of it comes this amazing power, and yet it's tied directly and, and continues correctly through watching how and what we do with these things. Our mouths, our tongues. Well, doesn't the Scripture said, death and life is in the power of the... And those that love it will eat its fruit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But well, we want to live life because we've been given life. How sad to not live the life we've been given. I heard a, a story one time uh, of, a, of a guy, and I don't know if it's a true story. I assume it is. I've, I've heard enough preachers tell it. It's either, it's either a true story or, or, or it's, a, it's a good enough illustration for that many preachers to use it. <laughs> one or the other. But a guy who went on a cruise... And, uh, you know, for weeks he's on this cruise and, uh, you know, he, he's, he's there and every, every lunchtime he goes into the dining room and, he, and he's got this bag of crackers and, and cheese spread or something like this. And, and so every day he gets these little crackers out and he puts this cheese spread in this thing and he's <coughs> eating these crackers. And uh, <coughs> one of the, um, you know, concierge or purser or whatever it is that comes up, and they come up and say, would, would you come over to the dining room and eat? No, 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 it's okay, it's okay. I'm fine here, I'm fine here. You know, and, and so he's going, he's, you know, he's saved up all this money to go on this cruise, and he, he, he spent his last dollar on the ticket, and he got, he's, on the, he's on the boat, he's so thankful to be on the boat, but he, he, you know, in his mind he's thinking, I, I spent everything to be on the cruise. I don't have enough money to, to buy anything in the restaurant. And so he's, day after day, week after week, he's eating these crackers. He's just got a bag of crackers, man. And on the, on the last day, you know, they've kind of got this bet going on in the kitchen as to why this guy's doing this. Does he not like the food? You know, has, has he got a strict diet? Can he, you know, is he, is he food intolerant and he can only eat crackers? I mean, what is it? So one of them gets the boldness to go up to him and ask him and, and says, listen, you know, we've all been talking about this. We've got to know, before you get off this boat, we've got to know, why is it that you would never come to the restaurant and eat? And this guy said, I told him the story. He said, I, I've been wanting to go on a cruise all my life. I saved up all my money. I spent my last dollar to be on this ship. He said, I don't have any money to buy any th food at the restaurant. The guy looked at him stunned. He said, did you not know? All the food was included in the price of the ticket. And, and, and so it is on a cruise. Wouldn't be sad. And we get to heaven. <laughs> the Lord returns. And we've, <laughs> we've not received and walked in all that's been purchased for us because we didn't realize what was available to us. And we didn't know how to, how to walk in that amazing favor and grace and supply and sufficiency and didn't know how to do that by faith. Wouldn't that be sad? Man, I think that illustrates, illustrates it well. Hmm. So we've talked a lot about this so far. But I want to lay another foundation for us. I want to talk firstly about Abraham. I want to talk about Faith and grace. And I want to I explain some things. I believe the Lord is going to increase you on the inside as you hear this uh, to be able to get a hold of this and walk this out on your life and not miss out, not be when you, when you get before the Lord for the Lord to say, why didn't you eat? <laughs> why didn't you eat? You know, some, some people talk about, you know, that we're going to have this great supper with this great, great supper in, in heaven. And yeah, we will. There'll be a wedding supper of the Lamb and it's going to be marvelous. But did you know that the Lord says that He was going to lay before you a table in the presence of your enemies? Did you also know that He's also laid it out for you to be able to come and dine 
while you're here right now, that you don't have enemies in heaven. Praise God. Hallelujah. So let's go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. You awake? Good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 4. Now I'm going to read through Romans chapter 4 to you in the New Living Translation. Uh, and I just want you to hear it in a modern vernacular so that we can understand what is being said here, not try to guess at some things and some curly words. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the Scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God and God counted it to him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they've earned. The people who are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God, who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who were declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who record the Lord has cleared of sin. Now, is this blessing only for the Jews or is it also for the uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. But how did this happen? He was counted as righteous only after he was circumcised. Well, sorry, was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised? Or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So, Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham had before he was circumcised. Verse 13, clearly God's promise God, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking a law is to have no law to break. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift and we are all certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That's what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you a father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would be, uh, become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Abram's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what, whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Isn't that good? That really clearly puts that and explains that. That Abraham himself did not obtain righteousness because of the law. In fact, 
It, in fact, it was 430 years before the law that Abraham had, had, had this encounter with God. So there's no way he could get righteous by obeying a law which hadn't been written yet. Does that make... Does that make the law useless? No. The law is perfect and beautiful and, and it expressed uh, the, the way of God. In fact, the law was a manifestation of God's grace to enable people to, to finally see what was right and stay away when, from what was wrong. But a person in, a, in, that, in that sense for those thousands of years having the law could not fully attain to the law in and of their own works. And so the problem continued to exist. The perfection of the law and the imperfection of people. The righteousness which comes by the law, through the law, in the law, in terms of its rightness. But that could not be that which made a person right in and of their own strength. There had to be another way. And his way was Jesus. His way was Jesus. Yes, sure. Our salvation. It's a righteousness or right standing with God is the best way to say it. Standing right before God without guilt or shame. Right standing with God. Righteousness is a faith. It is a faith. It's of believing God just as Abraham did. Right standing with God comes through faith. Again, verse 13, clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. Let me read that to you in the New King James Version. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of God. Of faith. Again, I want you to understand this. This is, this is not saying that all of the law has been done away with. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law, but to bring fulfillment to it. There is something that came through Jesus that enabled us not to forget that there was a dynamic of this perfection of God's Torah, but an ability in God to completely fulfill that in a way of living that is called holiness from a place and a standing called righteousness. And we've talked about that. Righteousness and holiness. We looked at that last week. The right standing with God that all men need could not come eternally by obeying the Torah or the commandments of God in and of themselves. As perfect as they were. Part of the reason for that is that the seed or so that the seed eternally would not be exclusively only from the Jewish nation. Now, God has a covenant with the Jewish people. That covenant has not been a done away with, and there are still yet things to walk out and be fulfilled in and through that. In a few weeks, we will uh, together, we'll come together and we will celebrate Pesach, the Passover. And we'll look at the different elements of that and we'll celebrate again the redemption of. Of, of the Hebrew children out of Egypt into, his, into the, the promised land, uh, into the wilderness and then on to, into the promised land. We'll celebrate that. And we also know, and we study here, and we celebrate God's promises to the Jewish people even today and all that He's doing through Israel. We believe that. We, we study that. We, we, we glory in that. We want, we, we, we're just so excited about being a part of that in these days and in this season. But God's heart and desire was that none should perish. It, it, see, if it was only of the law, if, if salvation and righteousness could only become, come through the perfection of the law, if that was the only way to obtain it, then you and I could not be saved because we're not Jewish. Right, well, I have a, a Jewish background. But you know what? At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the blood that flows through my veins is not going to be the thing that means anything before Jesus. It was the blood that flowed through his veins, which I've received, that washed away my sin. Now I know that the covenant that God has with the Jewish people is so strong 
that, and there's much study about this and there's much research you can do into it. But at the end of the day, God is, is not going to forsake them. But, at, but you still have to. Every single person that enters into that eternity with God, and there is only one way. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Praise the Lord. But God has, is making a way. There is a veil that's been over the eyes. And God is lifting a veil. And God is making a way. And God is a covenant with the Jewish people, even to today. But it's important that we understand that there is an opening. There is a, there is a, a dispensation now, a time, where, where beyond those who were given the law, there, uh, every single man, woman, and child on this planet has now got a way into this place of right standing with God through Jesus. Isn't that good news? It's good news. Now, let's look at this. The promise was fulfilled through Jesus. The promise to Abraham, the fulfillment of that, the totality of that was, was through Abraham because Abraham was able to become the father of faith. So Abraham's faith was accounted to him as righteousness before the law so that post-law, so that after the law, when I say post-law, I'm not saying again that it's been done away with, post-fulfillment, post-Jesus, post-Him being an, the absolute totality of what the law was supposed to represent in its righteousness. And, and so Romans chapter 8 says that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us through Him. See, if Jesus has done it all and we're all in Him, then we've done it all because we're in Him because He's done it all. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we now see the promise fulfilled through Jesus. Through the seed who was prophesied from Genesis chapter 3, it said, and her seed will crush his head. Talking about the serpent. Well, a woman doesn't have seed naturally. So by supernatural seed, but it's accounted to her. The seed is still accounted to her in the scripture. It's hers. And so that, that which came through that woman, that seed which, which then became the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Word made flesh, the seed of the Word made flesh, by faith now you and I in Him connect right into the faith that Abraham had and accounted him as righteous. Isn't that wonderful? And all of the fulfillment of those thousands of years of the Torah and when that was all that people had to hold on to is now fulfilled and brought into our lives in such a beautiful way. So verse 16 again, listen to it. So the promised is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. Who's the promise? Jesus is the promise. Jesus is the promise that Abraham's descendants would go way beyond just one nation. That he would be called Abraham, the father of many nations. Many nations. That doesn't exclude Israel. That includes everybody else. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course it does. And we are all certain, it goes on to say in verse 16, we are all certain to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, so that is including the Jewish people right there, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe that, the script, that what the Scripture Scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abram believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing. God, he, God calls those things which be not as though they were. He declares them to be. You know, God uses faith. Jesus talked about it. Have the God kind of faith. Have the faith that God has. How's that? It's, it's in the heart and it comes out of the mouth. If you believe those things which you say, nothing doubting. You believe them. It's interesting that it doesn't say if you believe those things which God says. Now, now that is certainly true because you can't believe anything if it hasn't really, it's not real faith if it hasn't come from God. But once it's on the inside of you, you have to believe what you say. There's, there's too many, do you know uh, we were talking in the car about this. There's been too many people that have walked away from, from a life of faith. And I'm not talking about 
a movement. I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm not talking about uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a group of people that call themselves just faith. Yeah, I don't mind that title. I don't mind people calling me a faith man. I, I, what, I mean, that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, people say, ah, oh, they're just those faith people. Is that such a bad... Why is that a slander? <laughs> it doesn't... doesn't anyway. <laughs> but here's the problem, is that people have tried to use what they've understood about faith as a system out of the head, not the heart. And so, confession, 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 that's fine. But if it's not out of the abundance of the heart, then it's not truly the kind of faith that Abraham had. And so, and so you can find yourself in a religious system just as quick as any other place, in any other time in history, in any other denomination, in any other... And listen, there's good, there's good the bad, and the ugly everywhere. And, but there's also the thread of a faithful uh, line of faith an inheritance everywhere. Everywhere. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, so we, we need to understand that faith works in the heart and in the mouth. It's interesting the brain doesn't even get a look in on that statement. <laughs> believe in your heart. How did you get saved? You believe, you believe in your heart. What? Right? You, we believe that he's been raised from the dead. And we confess with our mouths, what? The lordship of Jesus, that he's Lord. And we shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, right standing with God. So you've got to be in the right place first through what you believe to be able to make the next confession that Jesus is my Lord. And, and the, with the heart one believes unto right standing with God or righteousness and with the, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, unto Yeshua, actually, as salvation. Right, praise God. So we've got to understand that faith is a very, very powerful dynamic of this, what comes out of our mouth. Okay, so Romans chapter 4 and verse 6 in the New King James says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. It is of faith, heart, belief, mouth, confession, that it might be by grace. Okay, hold on to that. We'll talk about grace in a moment. Abram was able to, to able by faith to enter into right standing with God as far as was possible and became the father of of not only the Jewish nation, but also by faith, he became the father of everybody that would believe like him. I mean, that's re that was reaching not only into what was existent then, but also way into thousands of years into the future. Thousands of, 4,000 years into the future and, and beyond, right up to 6,000 years into the, uh, sorry, 2,000 years into the future to Jesus, and then 4,000 years into the future to right to us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The law was also a grace of God or a gift of God to show what was right and what was wrong. Faith brings you to a place of right standing with God. That place, now here's what I want to start talking to us about. Faith, faith brings us into this place of right standing with God. And that place is called grace. Grace is the presence of God, the glory of God. In, in, in God is a sufficiency that you won't find anywhere else. Outside of God, there is, that sufficiency disappears, dissipates, isn't there. That's why it's the throne of grace. He is enthroned in the sufficiency, the supply, and the favor. When you come to the throne of grace, it's not, it's not like the judgment seat, in a sense, because it's the throne of favor the throne of supply. Now, now the, the judgment has, that's been done on Jesus that you've already received, you now, you now come to that throne with a boldness. Why? Now, the, one of the things that the Bible teaches us is that we come boldly. Why do we come with such boldness? Because as He is, so are we in this world. He, he's already made us in His image. And we come, when we come before the throne, God sees Jesus. That's what He sees, the blood. 
that's been sprinkled on the mercy seat for always and forever. Once and for all, as Hebrews says. So it's of faith, heart, belief, mouth, confession, that it might be by grace or to, according to grace so that the promise might be for sure. So Hebrews 4, verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may ob- what? obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Without faith you cannot enter into the place of grace. You cannot do it by your own works. They don't please God. Only faith does. Why? Because it brings you in. It brings you into that place. I saw a picture the other day. Um, that someone posted it on Facebook. And there was that picture of the, of the torn curtain and the glory of God being released out of that place. Oh, marvelous. Not, not cont- God never wanted to be contained. He wanted to be in the heart of every man, woman, and child that would ever, ever live. Romans 5, if you want to turn there with me, Romans 5, verse 1. If you're there already. Therefore, having been justified by faith, justified, righteousness, sanctified, these, are, these, are, these have the same understanding, being placed in right standing with God by faith, we have peace, shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also we have access by faith into... Now, can you see how it's almost like a location? This grace. Access. When I say, see, when I see the words access into, I, I think of something like a door. So if faith is the door that through which you... You come into, which, which the door, well, you didn't make the door. <laughs> Jesus, in fact, the word scripture says, he is the door. So Jesus is the door. He made the door. He opened the door. <laughs> Everything about the door has got nothing to do with you, other than it's, it's shaped like you to walk through. It's a U-shaped door. And you come, you have access. What does it say? It says, We have access by faith into this grace now in which we stand. I'm standing right here in grace. I'm standing in the favor and the sufficiency and the supply of God through entering in by faith. Grace is not automatic, folks. It's automatically, it's automatically available to you. It's automatically yours. It's automatically uh, that which you can have. But it's not automatically accessed other than by faith. No more could Abraham enter into this place of right standing before the law without faith. Neither can we even through Jesus. Otherwise, if that were, if that were not true, then you would not have to use faith to get saved. We are saved by grace through faith. And even that moment of... uh, Is everybody going to heaven? Is everybody going to beyond heaven into an eternity with God? Everyone has the right to because Jesus has made the blood, has put the blood on the mercy seat. But not everybody will because they reject what Jesus has done. That's the sad part. That's the sad part. Everything's been purchased. Every supply has been made. All sufficiency has been paid for. The door has not only been made, but swung open. There's no veil or door of separation. Now it's there, and all we have to do is, by faith, Believe in our heart, put it in our mouth. Not just put it in our mouth. Believe in our heart, put it in our mouth. Enter into this grace in now which we stand. Isn't that beautiful? And suddenly we find ourselves seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we look down. It's, if you can imagine this, if you look, if you look, if your head's up here, it's, we're in the heavenlies. 
And you look down, and all of a sudden, oh, my feet are on the earth. Oh, I'm in, I'm in the heavenlies. Oh, my feet are on the earth. Can you see that? We're seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We, we are as much in existence in the heavenly realm as we are with our feet on the earth. We've got, we've got one hand on all the resources of heaven, and we've got another hand reaching out saying, Be healed. This is the grace in which we stand. What is that? That grace is that place that we're supposed to stand in as ambassadors for the anointing. Praise God. Well, I'm preaching myself happy, I tell you what. <laughs> it takes both faith and grace. Listen, it's, it's as wrong to major on faith without talking about the supply that it's supposed to bring as it is to major on the grace without talking about the faith in which we get it. We, we, we've got to be a balanced people. It's as wrong to talk about only the Word without the Holy Ghost as it is to talk about the Holy Ghost without the Word. Because they're both in perfect, perfect and beautiful alignment. And in a few weeks' time, we'll celebrate Shavuot, which is the name in the Hebrew calendar, the Jewish calendar, or Pentecost in the church's calendar. And it is the most powerful picture of the Word and the Spirit in absolute unity. The day the Word of God came to Moses on Mount Sinai, to the nanosecond, that exact day, only years and years later, thousands of years later, that exact same day is when the Holy Spirit comes, both in a manifestation of, of fire, the wind. Beautiful. And so we understand that we enter into this supply the favor of God. You walk, I don't, care if it's, I don't care if you're walking into a supermarket to buy a can of baked beans. The favor of God went in that room with you. I mean, the, you are a walking ark of the covenant filled with the Shekinah glory of God. And, and out of here is supposed to flow that glory. Rivers of living water. Hayimayim. Living water. Praise the Lord. So it takes both faith and grace. Faith is not simply a, a movement. It's not. You know, we talk about the healing movement and the, the charismatic movement and, and the faith movement. No, no, no. God, all God was doing was he was putting another level of revelation. Not pushing that one aside and now this is all, what it's all about. He was building another level of revelation. Progressive revelation. Mysteries revealed. Another mystery revealed. And they all dovetail. <clears throat> they all work perfectly. Praise the Lord. Unless you take one and you major on it so much over here and you... Now, you, it's okay to major on something if you stay connected to everything else. It's okay to zero, because at times you need to, as, as Malcolm so rightly said earlier, if you need bodily healing, then, then major on the scriptures concerning healing so your faith can get developed. But in so doing, you're connected to everything else. But if you separate from everything else and come over here and major on this, you, what you're going to do is, here's, here's what happens every time, you redefine what you're majoring, you're ma majoring on. And once redefined, it no longer connects. And once redefined, you can prove your point in every page of Scripture, but it's redefined wrong, so you're proving something wrong every time. But if you'll stay balanced and connected, then, then what God has you study and what God has you major on at the time, if you stay balanced and connected to everything else, then it becomes progressive revelation, not... What was I going to say? Well... It's gone. Whatever it was that it's not, it's, it's gone. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> well, deception, really, is what it becomes. I was going to say indignation. I was trying to figure out whether that's really worked or not. But I guess people get pretty, get pretty indignant when they get over there outside of everything else. It's true. 
So Romans 4.16 then says, Therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law. Which, do, which means they're not excluded. God, they're still, the Jewish people are still part of God's plan right now. But also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. This is, guys, this is not a gospel of exclusion. It's a gospel of inclusion to whosoever. Whosoever. But the whosoever still has to do something to enter into this grace. The whosoever still has to faith. But the whosoever is still anybody. The whosoever is not exclusively chosen. We can talk about predestination. We can talk about Arminianism and Calvinism. We can talk about both extremes of the, of the, 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 the theological discussion. And do you know what? God looks down at both and says, both. They both absolutely fit within how big God is. And if you go on either extreme exclusively, if you go over here on Arminianism to you know, all men, God wills that all men should perish, I believe that. But if you separate yourself from some of the, the scriptures that talk about um, that the, the, the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world and talk, that does talk about God has predestined you, if you exclusively cut those scriptures off and don't study those in the light of that, then you're also going to misunderstand time. What you'll do is slip back into a Greco-Roman mindset of time and see it only as linear, where God sees it Hebraically as a circle, as a circle, and the cross is is in a in a in an axis of that circle all the way down through history. And, and we miss suddenly the perspective that God wants us to have. He's bigger than what than our modern thinking. Praise the Lord. What happens when we, when we stay connected to it all? We stay in balance. And then we don't try and lift up one denominational banner over another one. Well, my church rather than your church. Listen, there is, there is uh, something uh, very accurate, very biblical about the authority of church. And you can't have authority structures within a church if people aren't submitted to it. And we could sit here and talk about New Testament church authority structure and everything else and commitment to that and all sorts of stuff. And there's all good and right. And at the same time, at the same time, we should be just as free to win someone to the Lord down there in Zilmere and recognize that they would fit more in that church down the road and be just as happy to introduce them to that pastor. Oh, pastor, that won't grow our church. Do you, you want to bet? No, don't bet because I'm not a betting kind of. <laughs> that will grow our church. Why? Because love is in operation on a, on a level and a dynamic that people haven't seen for a long time. That's right. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You're hearing my heart in this? We should be just as free to fill everybody else's church up as we are to fill up our own. Amen. Now, now, it's going to be natural to want to fill your own church, and we, we will, and we do want to bring people here. Of course we do. We don't want to funnel people away. Oh, well, I like that one, and we'll bring him in. Don't like that one. He'll send him in. No, we don't. No, 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 no. We're not selective on the fish that we catch here. But we are listening to the Spirit of God. And He places people in the body where He wills, not where we will. I didn't even mean to preach on that. But can you hear? This is my heart. This is my heart. Praise Lord. Faith is not a formula of confession alone that can be worked out by any, without any heart belief. It's the substance of things hoped for. So it has to be, there has to be biblical hope, which is the anchor of your soul. Faith must have the picture of hope, which means that the image of what God has said is firmly anchored in your soul. When the heart is fixed on this image and believes this image beyond all, any natural circumstance, then out of the heart comes words which, when released by the mouth, smash through the natural circumstances to establish God's word in the natural, the substance of which is called faith. Praise God. Faith is the catalyst that activates the grace, the favor, and the supply of God. When Paul complained to God, God, I've asked you three times now to get this devil off me. God said, Paul, 
You've already got all of the sufficiency that you need. My grace is sufficient. You, he was already standing as the righteousness of God, which means he was standing in this grace, which was already his. Praise the Lord. Grace sustains us on the inside. It's a divine force that upholds us as faith works. That, because that sufficiency is not from you to start with. It's from God. Uh, you know, it's in, in that time between. I think it's a Jerry Savelle that said that moment. That time between. Amen. And there it is. What 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 sustains you in that time is the grace of God. And and how do you access how do you access that grace that sustains you? By faith. It's that you're holding on to that word of God. But there's a supernatural sustenance that works in your life. Otherwise, if you let go of that, then you, all you have to do is lean back on your own understanding and that's when we let go of faith. And then we say, then, people, then you hear people say, oh, that faith stuff doesn't work. Well, that's calling God a liar for a start because he's a faith God. What they mean is, I tried that once and because I didn't do it by faith, because I wasn't actually working faith. And again, not talking about just locking into a formula. Because I didn't meditate the word so that it was actually revelation to my heart, because I tried to do it in my head and just employ a formula out of my head and then spout out some stuff out of my mouth, then it didn't work. But if you understand that you, it's not... Because that's hard work, by the way. Did you know that? To try to do this in your head, to try to live a life of faith in your head, to try to formulate, to hold. Now, what was that formula again? The seven steps of what was it? And, and sub-step A, uh, you know, oh my goodness, that's hard work. <laughs> it is. But when, it's, when, it's so, when that picture is so burned inside, when it's revelation to you, when it's in such a a strong place in your heart, and then it, you, you see, you don't, if you really have got this, if you've really got this hope, if you've really got this image, if you've really got revelation, you don't have to remember to confess. Out of the abundance of your heart, you do it. It flows out. It's like, oh yeah, I forgot to confess this today, and I forgot to confess that today. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying confession is not important. It is. But if you've, put all the emphasis on confession without understanding the heart belief. Now, I know that there, there is times, I know that the, the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So if you've not got anybody preaching at you all day, every day, then preach it to yourself. I mean, put it in your mouth so you can hear it, so that your heart can get revelation of it, so then your mouth can say it. But understand that all the time that you're saying it over here is that you've not necessarily released faith because the heart hasn't engaged yet. Does that make sense? So yeah, go ahead and say it, and say it until you believe it. True. But once you believe it and then say it, because you can't hold it back. We were talking at Life Group on Friday night about, about the gospel and about uh, the, a beautiful passage in the scripture. You know, the disciples are being reprimanded for preaching the gospel. And they said, you must preach no more in this name. And he's, this is what comes out of their mouth. We can't help it. <laughs> we cannot but tell. We can't help it. It's likely to come out of our mouths at the least appropriate time. Someone says, oh, don't embarrass, you know, you can't do that at the bus stop. Yes, you can. You can talk about him when you walk by the way, when you sit by the road. There is never an inappropriate time. In fact, the Bible says you should be ready when it's appropriate and even when it's not appropriate. In season, and out of season. It's likely, it's likely to come out of me at the most inappropriate time. God's likely to ask you to witness to someone at the most inappropriate time as far as you. Yes, but God, I'm supposed to be. Oh, but God, um, what if they... And he says, someone over there right now going to hell. Would you stop your agenda for a moment and go share Jesus with them? I was sharing, uh, again, uh, on Friday, just the story of the time when, when I was, we, we were living in Hawaii at the time, and, uh, and, and I was at, at the beach, you know, as you do, 
uh, in Hawaii. And all of a sudden, there's this guy, and he's, he's half inebriated, inebri inebriated. How do you even say that? I'm not, by the way. He's half drunk, and, uh, and, and he's the, he is a, a fearsome-looking man. I mean, he's about six foot four, built like a Mack truck, and had skull tattoos from head to foot all over his body. And God said to him, go and talk to him. Go and tell him about Jesus. Now, my, of course, your, initial, your flesh naturally says, no. <laughs> but but I, I knew better than that. I thought, ah, well, I guess what's the worst thing that can happen is I go to meet Jesus, you know. Um, so I went up to him, and he's sitting there, and I just, you know, I just started talking to him. And uh, just started talking to him about Jesus. And within moments... This guy's eyes, he just started, not just crying, he started sobbing. I mean, deep, right down deep from his soul, just sobbing, just brokenhearted, just crying and crying and crying. And I'm just, just sharing with him about Jesus, talking about Jesus, talking about liberty, talking about, about my Jesus, which could be his Jesus. And as he came to a close of his deep, deep, deep sobs, I led him to the Lord, would you like to receive the Jesus? I mean, this obviously was not difficult at this point now. Yeah. I led him in a simple prayer. And when he calmed down enough to be able to talk, he said, do you know why I have these tattoos all over me? I said, no, I, I don't. He said, I've punished myself. And each skull that I had tattooed on my body represents a person that I killed in Vietnam. And he punished himself for all of those years. And, and the thing is, the choice that I had was to walk past or stop my agenda for a moment and go and minister the love of Christ into this man's life, which changed his life forever. Now, I don't know. I went back and visited with him a few times before we left Hawaii, and I don't know whether, how, it would have, how, how it would have been when he walked into church, skull tattoos and all. But I trust, I believe, that God brought, placed him in the body as he will, put him in a place. I'd love to meet him again one day. I don't, I don't have contact with him anymore. But I know that, that moment changed his life. Grace sustains us and enables us. It helps us. We walk in the power of that grace, and we, we've entered into that grace by faith. We believed it in our heart, confessed it with our mouths. Grace is the powerful place of God's sufficiency. The that, faith, that door through which we enter is called faith and that works by the gift of God's love poured out as the promise and gift of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So the place of grace is right standing at the throne where all the sufficiency is that is now yours that you've been made joint heir of in Christ. Because this place of grace that by faith you've entered into is separate or holy, it's also the place of the person of the Holy Spirit who fills you and regenerates your spirit at salvation. This divine connection seats you in the heavenly places in Christ, in the anointed one and his anointing. Faith pours into you. Sorry, let me say this again. Faith pours you into him, and grace pours him into you, and then through you. Philippians 4.13 then says this, we know this well. I can do all things through Christ. Christ being who? The anointed one and his anointing. Talking about the Mashiach, the one the anointing came upon. I can do through all things through the anointing which Jesus carried for those years, which he is now sent to fill me with, to flow over me. That same anointing is connected because it's the Holy Spirit who by definition is separated and holy, who dwells in this place of right standing with God, which is where the grace supply comes from. Through that Holy Spirit that is upon me is directly connected to all of that anointing. And that's why I can do anything. Because He, the Spirit of grace, 
is on me. Isn't that good? He strengthens me. He's called the Spirit of Grace in Hebrews 10, 29. The gift of God through which faith works. Praise the Lord. So what does this mean for us? Bottom line, no excuses, I guess. There is not anything that has not been supplied for us. And you didn't even have to come up with the faith to access the grace. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so even that was a gift to you. We simply have to receive it and appropriate it. But how stupid would we be to sit back, put our feet up and rest in the wrong kind of rest? Lazy, spiritually, spiritual laziness. And not obtain and do everything with what God's called us to do. But there is a place of rest we enter into, but it's, it's the rest of faith. We strive diligently to enter into that place of rest. Put our attention into that. Everything else is hard work. It is. We've, we've already figured out the hard work of religion. Let's enter into the rest of our faith and stand in the grace and the supply of God. Amen? That ministered to you this morning. I trust it did. Praise the Lord. Let's stand up together. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you right now that in everything you have done for us through Jesus, we receive it and appropriate it by the faith that comes by hearing your word. And we thank you for the substance of that. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives to bring us this far to this season. And God, we're so grateful that, that as we stand here today, if we know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then we stand here by faith in this grace in this place of sufficiency, this wonderful place of su supply. And oh God, there's not a thing that we'll encounter next week that we go into, that there's not already provision made for it, provision before you can see it. And Father, I thank You that as a individuals, as, as, as couples, as families, as a church family, You have supplied everything for us. And Lord, we determine to guard our heart with all diligence so that out of it will flow these issues. And then we keep our mouths. We keep our lips. And we, we determine to speak that which is in abundance in our heart. Father, we worship You and we love You. We bless You. In Jesus' name. I want to give an opportunity now because I don't know everybody in this room. We're going to do the work of an evangelist. It may be that everybody in this room is saved and knows their Savior, just in case. I want you to do the work of an evangelist. I want you to turn to the person on your right, your left, behind you, wherever you can see someone and ask them, do you know my Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Have you received Him as Lord and Savior? Just go ahead and be, be bold about it. Be bold about it. Praise the Lord. And if a person said no or looked hesitant, I want you to ask them. This is a great time. Would you like to know Him now? Would you like to know Him now? Now we need to practice this, folks. It's as simple as that at times when, we, when we've had an opportunity to share about Jesus. So many people share about Jesus and then don't know how to bring that person into that moment of decision. And yet the faith, it's not your, it's not your job to try to supply them the faith. The faith of God comes by that word which you've preached. Pulled down all the strongholds. And now we invite them. Come and dine with Him. Come and be with Him.